এখনই রেকর্ড করার দরকার নেই যখন ডিপার্টমেন্ট স্টাডিজ হি ইস দ্য প্রফেসর ইন চার্জ অফ দ্য ম্যানেজমেন্ট গ্রুপ ইন দ্য ডিপার্টমেন্ট অফ ম্যানেজমেন্ট স্টাডিজ হি রিসিভ দ্যং স্কলার অ্যাওয়ার্ড ফ্রম the billa institute of management technology noida india at in 2023 and the guru vishishta award in 2024 from the dayanand sagar business school bangalore he received his phd from the university of calcutta in 2021 for his work on brand personality actually dr sonokra is too young Uh, Dr. Roy has published in academic journals and is indexed in Scopus, Web of Science, and ABCD. He has co-authored four books on domains such as entrepreneurship, development, business ethics, and effective facilitation techniques. The latest being Introduction to Entrepreneurship Development. published by oxford university press he has edited two books on management cases and marketing respectively he was appointed as a management expert at pbn times a uk based media tech company in 2018 in 2024 he was recognized by linkedin as a top brand strategy voice He has served as an educational and management consultant and a corporate trainer for organizations such as Stribo, NSOU, Semca, SEA, etc. He is profoundly interested in exploring innovative online tools for delivering quality higher education. Having authored a book on effective facilitation techniques using innovative ICT tools in higher education. His research interests primarily concentrate on the versatile dimensions of branding, consumer behavior, entrepreneurship, and organizational behavior. So he has done a lot uh, in is just, just as a young uh, professor, So over to you, Dr. Sonok Rai. You can start your lecture. Your voice is not coming. Hello. Voice is not audible, so, Professor Rai. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, you are on point is audible. Now? Now, now, now you are. Right. So thank you, Dr. Nundi and uh, to, uh, Dr. Anirban Ghosh. It feels like a reunion or... A homecoming once again, having been associated with uh, a few uh, workshops in the past with NSOU as well. So I hope right. you're doing well, sir. Um, yeah, yeah. Very, very good. Very good. Please continue. Right, sir. So the, this particular session, we will be uh, talking about uh, the various, um, you know, the, the, the video conferencing tools that we have, uh, that we use. in the context of uh, higher education in the context of various subjects that we go on to teach um, we are i am presuming there are approximately around 40 41 of us who have joined uh, participants who have joined in and i'm pretty sure all of us belong to different backgrounds different fields different domains and um, this uh, ict tools the use of these ict tools the use of these video conferencing tools use of these online learning platforms these are very much um, uh, you know uh, innate to all of us and i think covid 19 has been that uh, kind of a slap in the face for all of us having taught us you know the, the value of uh, online and learning online distance i mean online education distance education how how is this uh, how is this becoming so relevant with time so this has actually taught us this in a very very big way 
so this particular session i will we will try our level best to make it as interactive as possible uh I'm pretty sure all of us are uh, you know have been busy throughout the day with various activities and uh, you know the same uh, for me as well so we i will not uh, you know want to take too, uh, too much of pressure on myself to go on deliberating a lecture for 2 hours i don't want to do that so we will have a kind of a, a lot of discussions from time to time and make the session as interactive as possible and then we will have a general discussion with regard to the various you know the, the video conferencing tools and all uh, as we move forward so on that note let me just uh, share this uh, screen that i have just allow me a minute right. so i hope the screen is visible to all of us uh, out here let me make this full screen yes sir it's visible right thank you um great so let's um, start discussing what we were supposed to discuss for today but before i you know talk to us or uh, you know talk about or rather we deliberate about uh, the various online learning platforms and the various video conferencing tools that are present and that actually help us in understand or connect with audiences who are remotely settled across different parts of the country different parts of the world let's just take a pause to brainstorm or you know discuss about how we as educators in today's time how we can as um, you know uh, educators as teachers as professors of today how can we enhance and innovate online teaching various kinds of par paradigms that we have in online teaching to create a more engaging and effective learning experience so i would like to have a few inputs from the house first before we start talking about the core aspects of today's uh, session so i would be really grateful if uh, you know people could pitch in and then we can have a little bit of a discussion with regard to this and then continue our discussion forward so how we can as educators enhance and innovate online teaching what is your input with regard to this so that we can make our lessons lectures deliberations more engaging and effective may i sir yeah go ahead sir uh, good evening sir this is kostav chakravarty good evening sir uh, so by profession i am a computer teacher so i think i'll try to reflect a better ways of you know the online tools by which we can make our learning effective firstly sir uh, regarding the teaching profession there are multiple tools available in kind uh, in terms of audio visual materials in terms of activities in terms of uh, word cloud dictionary there are multiple tools available so each of this activity will give a different aspects of learning uh, so that uh, the learning process becomes very effective interactive as well as uh, as we normally nowadays we talk about gamifications in the teaching uh, in the teaching professions right. so it's a kind of a gamification that creates a curiosity and interest uh, for the learners uh, to have proper deep learning wonderful so thank you gosap sir i think that was a very very um, updated and a very uh, you know modern uh, way of approaching this particular uh, you know um, I mean, online teaching online learning paradigms that we have so uh, if we can just uh, just a second uh, if we can just have a uh, further set of inputs with regard to this from uh, other members in the house that would be you know uh, that would be excellent so we have got gamification uh, a very strong tool yes i know only some of the platform like teachment and uh, uh, google classroom right uh, mind mapping tools mm -hmm. so these are the some of the platforms i know all right but, uh, i don't know how to ex exactly use it and work on it Get to learn right right so yeah Because my, my i'm not a computer science background right we we don't Only have no alphabet no computer about. science background sir we are all from there. even I, i myself do not belong to this um, you know traditional computer science you know uh, background as such but when it comes to icd tools it's actually about or when it comes to these on, online tools uh, the whole point is actually not to rely too much on the technology part of things the objective is not to rely on the tech the tech part of things but rather to focus on how we can use the tech to our advantage 
in relation to whatever it is. The I have seen many faculty members or many professors getting carried away by the technology to an extent that they forget the core material that they're supposed to talk about in class or maybe in a particular session. So the focus is not really about creating the wow factor with your technology, but creating the wow factor with the content that we have in, you know, uh, have in place. So uh, when Gustav sir talk, uh, talked about a very relevant uh, point that is becoming kind of very popular nowadays, that is gamifying a classroom, gamification in the context of a classroom. The point here is, at the end of the day, when I'm gamifying a particular content within a module, uh, that I'm supposed to teach, it actually brings about heightened levels of engagement among the students. So the same lecture, which the student considered to be boring at a certain point of time, is now looked upon as interesting. Why? Because it's just packaged in a different way. That is the whole point of this particular you know, discussion for today. That is, how do we repackage um, our content and deliver it uh, to our students or to our target audience so they're able to understand or you know grasp the contents in a much more better manner. So educators of today need to enhance their online teaching paradigms. So it is not about upgrading their knowledge. It is actually about upgrading our ability to use online teaching more so that we can create more engaging content. So Gustav sir talked about uh, uh, gamification of the classroom. Um, Dr. Padmanava uh, talked about the uh, various tools such as uh, all these uh, learning platforms such as Google Classroom, etc., which we can leverage to the best of our advantage. The whole point is to make learning a little bit simpler, easy, user-centric and user-friendly for a larger audience, especially when yeah. it comes to distance. Moreover, learning beyond geographical framework. Absolutely. So learning permeating all boundaries, that is most important. So um, in, in today's context, I think that is more relevant at the time when we talk about the rising number of uh, students in the context of education. So we need to reach out to a larger audience. And there is no better gift than the gift of online education today to help reach out or disseminate to a larger audience. The very fact that we are able to sit down at 7 o'clock in the evening or at 7.20 in the evening for an online uh, you know, um, uh, FDP program is proof of concept. Traditionally, you and I, all of us, we would have to sacrifice a part of today's day. Probably I would have to take a duty leave, you know, as such uh, from my, you know, work, uh, a complete thorough duty leave so that, you know, or maybe all of us would have to, you know, take, uh, you know, a, a break from the course of our, you know, from the course of our work so that we could attend this session. But the point of this session is uh, um, so that we can break the barrier of place. So this is how we are, you know, trying to upgrade our online teaching and learning experiences. So just a basic thought before we you know, move ahead. This is very important for us to just take a step back and just appreciate the very fact that teaching learning paradigms, pedagogical paradigms are becoming more and more engaging and effective as we move forward every single day. So on that note, let's move forward. I do not uh, want to you know, delay this uh, too much. We will... Um, quickly move on to the core aspects of our discussion for today and then uh, there are some a few some of these quizzes and all that we'll have uh, from time to time and there's a little bit of an activity that i want to keep for the end of the session so that we can have some kind of a spirited discussion right so the first part is basically with regard to how, how online education has been growing with time see uh, i i do not want to jump into this you know uh, the content straight away the first thing that we need to, uh, that we need to appreciate is how online education has really flourished with time. So what I'll do is I will talk about these parameters, but with a very careful eye, I will also deliberate upon the various video conferencing tools. I, I, I would appreciate if the uh, participants could uh, mute themselves while the session is on. That would help in the uh, deliberation. So I'll, I'll keep a very careful focus on how we can use video conferencing tools and AI platforms or maybe, you know, various kinds of new platforms, you know, that we have for online learning and teaching so that we can, you know, um, go about it from the very, from the very base of it itself, from the very beginning itself, right? So the, one of the biggest factors that have influenced online education in the recent past is technological advancements, right? So technology has, you know, really boomed up in our country in the recent past and the evolution of technology uh, included, uh, you know, improving, let's say we have seen internet connectivity increased. Uh, you know, increasing with time. There was a time we used to use data packs like pockets of gold. Literally, that is how we used to use uh, our in internet data packs at a point of time. From there to a fact that we are using uh, internet, uninterrupted internet throughout the day, 
without any hassle is basically proof of concept, proof of fact, right? So the the you know the explosion of all these mobile learning apps in our country, the use of these digital learning platforms and these interactive platforms has actually transformed in uh, this online education in the Indian context. This uh, advent of 5G, as we talk about today, has actually allowed students, even in the remotest of places, I understand this is in collaboration with Dotarkand Open University, where there are several remote areas. Uh, if you go towards Pithoragar site and all these places in Uttarakhand, for example, um, the, uh, the Uttaranchal uh, region primarily, so these are places where it is difficult to get even a basic um, connectivity, basic connection, um, you know, uh, telephone connection. Forget about internet. So we have reached out the ability to reach out to these places, you know, through the likes of platforms like Baiju's and uh, Unacademy and uh, you know brands like Vedantu. So they have popularized e-learning in these remote schools and colleges uh, as well. Rather to be precise, to these college and uh, school students as well out there. So the rise of this AI-driven personalized learning tools has actually provided customized educational experiences to all the stakeholders concerned. So this is very important at the very beginning to appreciate and understand. We have seen how education, online learning has, uh, has become ubiquitous. So education today is no longer Indian as such or depend, I, I will rephrase what I said, Education is no longer constricted to India and India itself. It is, I beg your pardon, it is a global phenomenon. So online learning has actually enabled, um, you know, uh, Indian students to access global educational content. So sitting back at my home, I can uh, engage with content across the world. Um, for example, one of the uh, professors in the beginning was talking about how she had to leave for an uh, for a certificate program. The fact that we can sit back at home and attend these certificate programs across the world is again a very very good you know testimony to what we are discussing right now. So platforms like for example Coursera, sitting back at home, I can attend uh, uh, maybe a small little program of two hours or three hours from the Stanford University and uh, you know be certified with regard to this right. So Coursera, EDX. Khan Academy, these are platforms that have actually facilitated these, uh, this cross-border education. So in the context of online learning platforms, these are brilliant platforms to talk about. So it has allowed students to earn certifications from prestigious institutions such as Harvard or maybe MITs for that matter. Even Indian universities, you know, why just the Western Front, even Indian universities have joined the trend. So we've seen a lot of these MOOCs, uh, you know, uh, massive online uh, pro in these courses, I know that have been talked about a lot of these collaborations coming in from uh, the likes of foreign universities as well. So the UGC had been very much, uh, uh, you know, acknowledging the fact that we need to provide this liaison with foreign universities. We've seen, uh, for example, IIT Bombay making a strategic collaboration or an alliance with online courses on Swayam Pro portal, that is the Indian government's digital learning initiative. So this really proves to us that education is becoming, truly becoming globalized, right? And the biggest reason why we are here is to appreciate the fact that online learning is now becoming lifelong learning. Why? Because there was a time when you used to confine education to a few years, and that was a gateway or a gate pass or a token pass for our jobs or our occupations in the future. But today, as education or as learning primarily has become kind of uh, ubiquitous, we talk about lifelong learning and even the governments, um, you know, be it the Ministry of Education or be it the uh, UGC or AICT, whatever it is, they've all talked about the growing relevance of lifelong learning, right? So in this rapidly changing job environment, there is a very strong demand for online, uh, beg your pardon, ongoing uh, skill education programs or skill enhancement. So I cannot sit back at the end of the day and claim that, look, I'm a management professor and I'm very, you know, good in terms of, you know, whatever content that I have to deliver in management. I have to upgrade myself. I have to learn from the likes of uh, probably a Dr. Costa out here uh, who's present out here uh, and learn about the use of computer technology and find out how is it that management and computer science can leverage knowledge with each other so that we can both benefit from each other's, you know, um, knowledge or you know, we can benefit from each other's uh, learnings. So that is essentially the point. So where I need to be updated about the use of AI, at the same time, I need to be updated about the use of analytics so that I can use management education or take, I can take management education to a whole new level. So this is the reason why we talk about lifelong learning in today's time. 
So it is evident in the rise of professional development courses on, um, you talk about Upgrad, for example, it's a very good platform that we have for online learning, one of these online learning platforms, which is one of the, uh, in a focus areas for today's discussion is this online platform as well, right? So we talk about the likes of Upgrad uh, platforms like Simply Learn in the Indian context, where sitting back at home, I can easily pursue a course in digital marketing from, let's say, a, a, a university in the US. And by doing so, I can be very much job ready in such a manner that uh, whatever I learn within the confines, within the confines of an internet um, you know, based paradigm is now replicated to a real world job field. So this is how we are talking about the growth factors in online education. See, and in fields like data science, digital marketing, we talk about business management, whatever be it, uh, this is also complemented by the fact that the, the Indian, um, I mean, the national education policy, NEP 2020, it also emphasizes a very, you know, flexible path. It talks about a flexible learning path for skill-based education. Uh, education. And uh, this skill-based education, it supports the idea of lifelong learning as an integral part of career development in India, right? So the NEP 2020 has been heavily banking on lifelong learning. So we were just having a seminar in our uh, institution few uh, you know months back where we were talking about the um, gradual decline in traditional education. Traditional education is basically classroom uh, dominant education. I'm not talking about the uh, I'm not talking about the fact that classroom education is dying. Classroom education will continue, even this is traditionally a classroom. But the point here is we need to upgrade our classrooms, not only infrastructurally, but also in terms of our mindset. So gone are the days where if a student, for instance, says that I'm unable to come to campus, I cannot attend today's session. If the student really demands, I must provide this parameter of listening to this particular session remotely from the comfort of his or her home. So this is where lifelong learning also comes in. So this is in terms of a particular point in time where in terms of lifelong learning, we talk about applying our knowledge across time with regard to the job market. And uh, we spoke about pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic in the very beginning of the session. There's no doubt about it. See, um, uh, Dr. Padmanava spoke about Google Classrooms. See, with lockdowns in place, I think uh, Google Classroom, Zoom, MS Teams, these kind of platforms were actually a godsend. They came as a godsend to us because we could actually connect with our uh, students without actually breaking that lockdown barrier. That is very important. Is MS Teams or is Google, uh, Google Classroom an invention of COVID-19? Absolutely not. These were there before it as well. But we failed to appreciate the true value of a Google Classroom until COVID hit us. So if, if this is something that has found benefit during the last three years or last couple of years, why not carry forward the trend even further so that we can reach out to a larger cohort? That is the whole point. So the pandemic highlighted the challenges in this digital access as well. This is also critical. So it prompted a lot of these government initiatives such as PMs and the PM uh, eVidya program. So it actually helped bridge this digital divide. It was actually a very big you know, good uh, program this. So this rapid shift has actually led to a permanent change in the acceptance and um, I would say integration of online education within our traditional system. That is essentially uh, how online education has flourished. So I, I hope I've been able to impress upon all of you uh, how these growth factors in online education have been really you know, booming forward and how these have become so uh, relevant in, in today's context. So that we can, you know, understand this, um, you know, this idea of remote, uh, remotely reaching out to audiences in a very quick uh, span of time. So with that note, uh, let's uh, continue our discussion forward uh, as we more, move more towards the core aspect of our discussion. It's important that we have an overview first, appreciate the overview, and then move forward into the core learning platforms that we're going to talk about. I will not, uh, I, ha I have on behalf of NSU in the past, I've also taken several workshops and hands-on programs with regard to ICT tools. But I firmly believe that online modules are not really the best way of hands-on tools in just about a couple of hours. We cannot do justice to, you know, a, a complete online, um, I beg your pardon, a complete uh, learning experience if I were to discuss all the tools in, you know, um, in a hands-on approach. 
So what I'll do is uh, in this particular one and a half hours uh, or um, as such, we will have a spirited discussion with regard to all the tools where I'll just provide an overview about them, uh, about these things so that we can, you know, come back and we can apply them. The one thing I always keep on maintaining is no traditional books or no traditional uh, webinars or seminars, anything in the world for that matter, would teach us something unless we ourselves are immersed in it. For instance, before learning about uh, this uh, um, LMS, learning management system called Moodle, um, I, I, before we learned about it or before learning about MS Teams for that matter, I uh, we were given a lot of these training sessions and all, right? We were taught or trained about how to use MS Teams or how to use Moodle, which is a learning management system. I did not learn any of these platforms until I myself used my hands to find out what this is all about. So this is the whole point of a workshop where it tries to stimulate an idea and the ultimate conversion of the idea happens when we as participants, maybe we, we go back and we find our relevance in the various apps and the various tools and the various platforms that are available. So in terms of online learning, there has been a surge, there has been a growth in online learning traditionally, right? So look at the pre-2020 paradigm where limited adoption was there. We talked about it right now, right? So before 2020, online education in India was steadily growing traction. It was very steady, very slow. And it was it was particularly true for skill development courses. If you see and think about it carefully, you know, this was primarily used for test preparations. For example, I remember many of these IAS training centers in, in Delhi, in New Delhi, they would often provide their you know, learning programs, etc., uh, to students across India on an online basis. So it was restricted to a few groups of people or sometimes uh, online uh, online corporate training because the company did not want to spend a huge amount of money in providing transit and all these accommodation. So or, uh, corporate training would often take place in an online basis. So maybe uh, that was the maximum level to which we used uh, online uh, learning uh, paradigms, but it was never a part of core mainstream education. I am not uh, going to the extent of digital uh, or beg your pardon, distance education uh, courses with regard to how they have maintained this paradigm of you know using online uh, platforms to the best of their advantage. But keeping that aside, I think traditional organizations, institutions, including institutions like ours, where I belong to, St. Xavier's, we are also very slow to adapt uh, to online platforms um, because face-to-face -face learning remained the norm. That was the whole point. So platforms like Baiju's, Coursera, these were actually very popular before 2020 as well, but their reach was very confined to niche audiences. So there was limited uh, internet penetration in rural areas, etc., etc. So majority of the students in the rural suburban areas, for example, they were not exposed to online education at all. And more importantly, online education is a primary mode of education or learning. So in the 2020s, the pandemic, for example, the rapid shift that came about because of COVID-19, this was the crossroads, this was the turning point. So it propelled online education into the mainstream. So with our you know, uh, schools and colleges uh, across India, they were very quick to adapt to online learning. Um, with I think approximately, if you look at it that way, more than 85% of higher education institutions, HIIs across India, they transitioned to online, uh, you know, uh, teaching online. So this is why Zoom, Google Meet, Microsoft Teams, this is how they were born literally, you know, uh, or rather reborn in certain cases. So recognizing this need, the Indian government launched that uh, e with their program at this point of time. So this was to ensure accessible digital education. So universities, for example, collaborated with, uh, you know, um, this uh, Swayam portal, Swayam portal and NPTEL, that is. Uh, this, these provided a bundle of these digital courses uh, to millions of people. Now, if you see very carefully, uh, private pa partners or startups, for example, like, um, you know, Unacademy, uh, Baiju's, Vedantu, etc. They also rapidly scaled their operations during 2020 period. So they offered live classes, they offered virtual laboratories, labs, that is, uh, interactive study materials. So all of a sudden, all those students who had to go to quota, for example, to prepare for their joint entrance examinations, they found a lot of comfort and solace in sitting back at home probably sometimes and taking their courses on an academy. So these kinds of courses and these kinds of platforms became, uh, again, very much a godsend in, in, in such situations. 2021 onwards, we started to change a bit. We were no longer using the core online model as such. 
but we started to become a hybrid as the impact of COVID-19 started to uh, fade out a little bit. And then it came back once again, though, but we started to adapt to uh, hybrid learning models because in-person classes once again resumed. And now we as organizations, as institutions, we recognize the value of maintaining uh, some online components and some offline components for flexibility purposes, right? So this was the norm. So um, the new education policy also endorsed uh, for the first time, it endorsed and acknowledged that digital learning is as good as maybe a traditional program. For the first time, all these distance learning programs, which were waiting for their turn to get a credible you know, acknowledgement, were now given their due share or due recognition, right? So hybrid models became the new norm. We've seen how distance learning has taught us this very fact that, you know, um, what has been going on for so many years, this business, this, this particular uh, teaching learning model is now carried forward to other traditional institutions and organizations as well, right? And in future, we are probably moving more towards a global, uh, if you talk about the global um, online, uh, you know, this uh, market, education market. This has actually unfortunately become a commoditized market. Unfortunately, uh, it is now expected to grow significantly. Projections are suggesting that this can grow up to $319 billion by 2025. This is not a joke. This is a huge amount we're talking about. And in India, the trend towards uh, digital uh, learning, hybrid learning is also very much likely to soar ahead. Thanks to our uh, Reliance Geo and all these in internet penetration and all that, it's actually become much more easier and con you know, comfortable. But we are also seeing the likes of, uh, for example, AI-driven uh, personalized learning. We are we are seeing we have already seen the you know onslaught of Chat GPT in in today's time, right? We've seen how Chat GPT has made its inroads and AI and uh, you know has made its inroads in in the context of uh, teaching learning. So that is very much you know gaining in precedence. Same time, uh, we are seeing the growth of AR and VR for immersive education, where I can immerse myself in the cause of a particular you know learning paradigm. And even for that matter, as Coastal Sir was talking about the growth of gamified learning experiences for, for enhancing online education's engagement and effectiveness. So this is what is projected in the future. So gamifications, AR, VR, AR and VR, that is, you know, um, these are now becoming the new norm. So that is virtual reality, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I, I hope things are uh, going great uh, so far. I mean, we are all able to, you know, um, uh, follow it up on the same page. And uh, let's yes, move sir. forward then. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. So let's just have a brief look, you know, in order to understand the different kinds of, you know, online education or online learning platforms. We need to first learn about or understand the different trends that are going around in online education first, so that we can talk more about this. Uh, at the very beginning, we have uh, these micro learning modules, bite sized learning modules. Education today is becoming like an Instagram reel. You know, the education of today or the learning of today is becoming like our Facebook and Instagram reel. So we want everything within 30 seconds and crisp and packaged, well designed for us because our attention spans are probably dwindling every single day. So um, if you look at any traditional LMS program, like for example, Coursera or even the one that you have, none of the courses are for two hours, three hours, four hours long. They have been broken down into very, very small pockets. How we are becoming so attention defici uh, deficient or we have this attention deficit. Podcasts, if you if you can connect with, I, ho I hope or, or I'm uh, pretty much, um, I'm sure that all of us know what a podcast is and how podcasts have been, uh, you know, becoming very popular in our country. Podcast is a thing of just about a few years. It's not very old, this concept, right? But people today are breaking down podcasts into different, different segments so that people do not have to watch the, or you know listen to the whole podcast. They can listen to only a small portion of the podcast, which is going to be relevant to them. When are they going to listen to this? When they are commuting, on the commute, while they are traveling. On the commute, you're going to learn. Gone are the days where we say that you're supposed to come to a classroom to attend this particular session. In micro learning, we are saying you record the whole session, break it down. There will be teams dedicated for this where... The portion on online education, trends in online education will be a core, will be a small module for maybe about one minute to two minutes at most and packaged towards you in the form of a, in, in your, in, in the component of your LMS. 
this is what we refer to as micro learning it is becoming a norm of the day it is becoming a big big uh, component of today i gave you the example sometime back of an academy they do not give you a full fledged lecture interestingly if there is a specific component within a science module like for example there is a specific engineering uh, concept that you want uh, you know to learn about or you're stuck with you can actually search for that specific component itself all the lecture had been going on for more than 1 hour it is repackaged in the form of just about 1, one minute or so this micro learning is now becoming something of a reality and today students expect us to you know deliver you know or you know provide to them hand or it or uh, what beg your pardon uh, spoon fed notes spoon fed content so that is why we need to also upgrade themselves uh, I, i belong to the field of marketing i'm a marketing uh, you know a student i'm a marketing uh, you know a professor and a marketing practitioner as well so i always believe in this fact that you know give the customer what they want all the students are never our customers that way but if this is the demand that is prevalent in our society as of today i don't think you know i am any individual you know one great individual to suddenly bring back you know the change you know uh, from the past so i have to either adapt or i will perish so this is very important so th this is why micro learning is so critical the others are of course very important we talk about you know micro learning definitely but personalized learning paths right see uh, as an individual i need to have a customization a customized approach the sense of personalization is very important i need to see for example if this is a traditional classroom i would not have got to see dr padmanava's uh, you know um, name on uh, on a screen on the screen or or any any individual participants name i would have probably referred to them as uh, you know by by their uh, name if i knew them or otherwise by their ids or whatever you know way possible the fact that right now in the online space this is also a cue or a hint that we are becoming more you know personalized in terms of our approach see our names are written for all of us so i will address you by your name i will address you who for who you are similarly in terms of a learning paths as well we want to you know access resources at our own pace in the way that we believe it is best i do not want to follow the pace that you are embedded you know that you are providing to me that is why you will see many of these mba programs which are often distance mba programs they tell you that the total course duration is 2 or 2 years it's a 2 year program but you can continue to give the exams for up to 4 years which means i am giving you time and that is extendable up to a year as well after that why because i'm giving you umpteen amount of time to prepare your lesson learn it according in accordance with your comfort zone you should not fall into that rat race where you are all given exam for this just for the sake of it and then you know get some marks out of it right so uh, this is what it is so uh, when we leverage data analytics when we leverage ai to create customized learning paths it actually helps us assess each and every learner's strengths weaknesses their preferences we can adjust our course content also accordingly right so it could be for competitive exams it could be for k12 students it could be for hais it could be for anybody the third is when we talk about adaptive learning technologies for gamifying a classroom we need to provide a game uh, we we need to you know upgrade our lessons uh, gone are the days where we just go ahead and give lectures in class right so we can provide engaged engagement Uh, sorry enhanced engagement through our um, game elements for instance you know in the past for nsu itself we had done this you know a simple quiz uh, is is great absolutely i can turn you know i can just have gone out a quiz in a quiz right now but what if i convert that quiz into a little bit more and create a kind of a mystery room out of it it's the same thing exactly the same thing but the student has to come out of a particular maze or particular puzzle until and unless they give the answers to the question that is asked for is it very difficult and complicated absolutely not to create these things it is very simple for instance simulations in business we often use uh, case studies as a way of you know reaching out to students because that's a way to solve problems but nowadays several business schools are showing the light where they provide simulation packages wherein they tell them on the spot in a case study i will still provide answers theoretically in a simulation program i have to behave in a manner as if it is really happening so that is how we need can gamify the classroom make it much more lively right so there are platforms like for example there is a company called skill link uh, which uses gamifying uh, gamification to make uh, engineering courses 
much more engaging for college students. Just an example, right? Baiju's, I, I, to the best of my knowledge, I believe it is, although Baiju's is probably not a very good example to give today, but I think it was also one of the early companies to gamify their content towards their target audiences, right? So we are providing more and more interactive gamified approaches to our target audiences, which is basically the students of today. And the future of today will move towards blended approaches. That means um, blended learning combines online digital tools along with face-to-face -face engagement, right, or instruction. So as a student, I have a balanced approach, right? So this actually helps the students to a great extent. So uh, for example, I, I can give the example of our college when we used uh, Microsoft Teams. Um, we use Microsoft Teams in a manner so that we can use, uh, we use it in a hybrid manner. So we often integrated it as a part of our routine classroom, you know, programs. There are many of these IT programs that we keep on, on hosting. For example, the first few sessions that we have, the first few courses uh, or classes that we have are all face-to-face -face learning. But then we conduct, we often conduct guest lectures and sessions. And we ask the resource person to deliver a session online uh, in the fifth, say, fifth period or in the last session or whatever it is. And the, stu the students really engage with uh, these programs. There have been cases where teachers who have been unwell have taken classes in an online mode where the students are in campus. So this kind of a hybrid approach actually helps the cause of higher education in the days to come. So I, I hope uh, these trends, this concept of online education, online learning, uh, con the, the, the online learning paradigm, these are all well appreciated by all of us so far. So this was just a general discussion first that I wanted to make before we talk about the core aspects. Now I will pace up a little bit more, right? So first thing that we need to understand is what is an online learning platform, right? It is not an online learning course. A course comes within a platform, right? So an online learning platform is what we are using right now. I have designed a course or a program within this particular platform, right? So online platform could be the LMS that is provided to you. That is an online learning platform where or there are quizzes, there are, um, you know, your assignments, there are learning modules, everything, and including assessment as well. That complete package where I provide a complete access to educational content is what I refer to as an online learning platform, right? Uh, I, I hope um, it is uh, okay so far, you know, when, uh, although it's becoming a, a bit, you know, um, uh, one way in, in this sense. Yeah. Baiju, yes, yeah. sir. Sure, sir. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, you're absolutely right, yeah. sir. I've just seen the chat right now. Baiju's is insolvent. So that's the reason I mentioned. Baiju's is probably yeah. not the best example to give right now. Yeah, it's but... a Ravindran. The CEO is Ravindran. Yeah, yeah. Baij, Baiju Ravindran. Absolutely. But yeah, there are lots to learn yeah. from his as well. Now, there are plenty of negatives that the company has done and plenty of negatives yeah. from the founder himself. But quite a few positives that Baiju's has actually taught us which we can actually use. Yeah. Not everything is negative about a company. Yeah. Right. The next point in our discussion is a course marketplace. Many of us, you know, often we believe that course, uh, you know, uh, these are uh, platforms. But see, many learning platforms are commonly referred to as online course marketplaces. Like, for example, we'll take one example of Moodle in just about a few minutes from now. Because it allows their learners to search uh, and purchase online courses directly, right? So it gives a complete package. Like for example, Coursera, it offers uh, Coursera Plus. Just an example. I mean, this is just a blunt example. A uh, Coursera Plus gives you access to all possible courses that are embedded within this, right? So you don't have to go to multiple, multiple, you know, platforms to keep on scouting for these courses, right? So this is very much required. I think every institution nowadays is now starting to offer. I was reading this uh, newspaper article just about, I think, yesterday, if I'm not wrong, or the day before, where one of the limitations of IIM, uh, the, the top IIMs, including IIM Ahmedabad, is the fact that they do not, they have not yet recognized uh, blended learning or digital learning as such uh, on their own. Yes, they have collaborations with other organizations, with EDX, they have collaborations with uh, other uh, private players and all that. But the point is, they themselves have not emphasized a complete or a thorough digital learning platform them you know as such so the course marketplace is still a question mark despite the fact that they are i am amdavad probably if you talk about is the country's best business school available right so this is very important to consider so how do we select the right platform we'll quickly move through this number one there could be the problem is that you know there are several platform choices which platform to actually go to or go for 
should we go for moodle should we go for zoom uh, wake your pardon should we go for uh, you know microsoft teams should we go for a google classroom should we go for something which is free versus should we go for the paid version so finding the right fit is very important in this case right because we need to know for what purpose are we using the um, the the program in our college i'll give you an example from our institution we have access to both Zoom as well as the Zoom private, uh, the, 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 the one license that is meant for everybody, the professional license that is, uh, as well as MS Teams. Initially, we were, we were having a discussion that is after COVID-19 was more or less over, we thought, why maintain a license with uh, you know, MS Teams? We are very good with you know Zoom. We can do this with Zoom only because for all official communications, we used to use Zoom. And for all learning and everything, for student learning and this entire platform we used to use Microsoft Teams, which was almost like a learning management system by itself, almost, right? Although it's not a pure LMS. But the thing is that um, we decided to retain both the accounts. We decided to purchase and maintain the license for both. Why? Because Zoom is, it has its own set of features and benefits. On the other hand, Microsoft Teams has its own set of benefits. On Zoom, we could not share or uh, distribute uh, notes, handouts, uh, sessions, uh, session programs as effectively, probably as much as we could do in MS Teams. We found MS Teams is much better as a learning platform as compared to Zoom. With all due respect to Zoom, of course, I'm not saying it's a bad platform to use, but it was a better platform to use when it came to traditional classrooms replaced in the online mode. When it came to sessions like this, webinars and etc., we always preferred to ha have Zoom. Because it was, it used a lot less space. It was much faster, and it could reach out to a larger audience. It also hosted, you know, provided several benefits like a uh, video recording was much better. MS Teams came up with recording a little bit later, um, you know, as such. There were a lot of benefits, so we will talk about those as well, right? And then uh, balancing the features, its usability, long-term scalability of this. So these are some of the challenges uh, that we, you know, talk about in the context of. How do we select a right online learning platform? So on this note, we need, need to understand now, what are some of the uh, online course creation tools, right? So I have not shared this uh, complete table with all of, all of you right now. I will probably share this with you. Um, there, These are several courses, you know, the, uh, let me just uh, quickly share this one. Uh, by any chance, is this Excel file visible with all of us? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. visible, visible, right? So I hope visible. you can see this uh, Excel file. I have basically made a kind of a summary. I will I'll share this document with you. I, I uh, did not share this earlier. It's my my mistake. Um, it's a, a list of all the different types of uh, learning platforms that we have, and all its features that come along with it, including its pros and cons, in terms of whether it supports you know video, audio, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's a list of everything, right? So for the ones that are readily available, these are the ones in India, right? The point of this, you know, the point of this, um, these courses or these particular programs is, is important as well. Why to use, let's say, I'll give an example. When are we supposed to use uh, Udemy business? This one. When are we supposed to use Udemy business? When we want to learn something very quickly. We want to use LinkedIn learning when we want to communicate a sense of pride associated with completing a particular course, right? So there are several reasons why we want to associate ourselves with something. But for both, uh, you know, but for LinkedIn learning, for example, we have no LMS. There is no LMS out here. You have to complete the course, you know, uh, all, all the way. But for Udemy business, you can take your time. There are bits and modules, there are quizzes, there are completion programs. At the end of it, you get a complete program out of it, right? It could be Udemy or it could be Udemy for business. I've just clubbed it all together out here. Same for uh, brands like Skillshare and Coursera, EDX. You have uh, Khan Academy, you have you know uh, Podia, you have iSpring Learn. So this is a list of all of them. It is not humanly possible right now in a matter of just minutes for us to discuss about all of these terms, I know one by one. So I will share this and all of us can go through this at our own pace, right? Uh, so again, lifelong learning. So this session does not necessarily mean that, you know, it, it ends uh, within this one and a half hours. The session means it is just a trigger. Like when we, you know, use a matchstick to ignite uh, a you know, candle, um, it is almost like this. My job here is just to ignite and the rest of the learning continues from this point.
So these are some of the online course creation tools that we need to you know, appreciate first, right? And these course creation tools have really convinced to us the importance of, you know, um, uh, you know, a blended learning, hybrid learning, you know, all these paradigms. And it is telling us that now it is high time that traditional uh, courses, course providers, institutions also upgrade their knowledge and upgrade their content, right? So this is the first part of our discussion with regard to online course creation. So let's talk about some of the top online platforms that are available for online learning, right? So what are some of them? So here we're talking about brands like Moodle, for example. Moodle is basically a open source platform. So you just need to use an organizational account for creating a Moodle account, Moodle uh, as such for making the LMS. It is very, very user friendly and very, very easy. I can give you my word of honor that this is very, very simple. You need to have a proper program. That is why if you see carefully in your activity, I have basically emphasized creation of a online course. That is the focus. The focus is not the software. The focus is actually the online course that you're designing and the content and how you're going to deliver. So Moodle is just going to assist, assist me in this particular journey, right? So Moodle's advantages are basically, it's a broad learning management system. It's a very extensive one where I can get a lot of these customized tools interactive tools like you know, maybe setting quizzes and programs and um, you know assessment uh, questions or or whatnot right i can create an engagement with my you know target audiences it could be customizable it could be resource uh, it could be used for uh, sharing of notes uh, handouts resources materials whatnot right so this is why moodle is one of the top online platforms that is used in the context of online learning okay uh, the scope of this session actually uh, pro prohibits me from uh, doing a hands-on with, uh, you know, all these sessions, but maybe later, you know, may, you know, uh, sky is the limit. We can have this discussion all uh, any time later as well. Um, maybe we could have an entire discussion with regard to how to use Moodle and how to use it for developing an effective course and launching your own course. So you don't have to go to Udemy to launch your own course. You can do this in Moodle as well. You don't have to wait for a call from, let's say, Swayam Portal so that you are enrolled as one of the, you know, presenters at this online uh, course or for this online course, right? So Moodle is one of the effective ones. There are other platforms as well. Like, for example, you've got a platform called Blackboard Learn, right? So I'm mentioning some of the ones which are very, very popular and very, very effective. I do not want to mention a list of 100 platforms. I, I myself do not know how to, uh, how the, I mean, how the interfaces look like. So maybe I can use them, but I do not know how they look like. So there's no point in showing off by telling, you know, people, you know, these are the list of, you know, 100 different platforms. I've just shortlisted a few of them. So Blackboard, actually, Blackboard Learn, the advantage is that as an instructor, as a as a facilitator, uh, you know, I can, uh, I beg your pardon, I can uh, create, uh, you know, organize and deliver course content much better, in a much more better manner, right? So uh, there's a much better sense of connecting with our target audiences. The discussion boards out here are much more user friendly, right? It's much more user friendly as compared to Moodle and the previous one, right? So this one also has a lot of these, you know, ICT tools. Like for example, I could use an assessment test. I could use a survey. I could use an assignment. I can also have automatic grading options, right? So where keywords can be traced. Today it's possible for example, in our college, in our campus, we use a program called Shikshak. We use a learning management system called Shikshak, which actually helps us. We have been uh, continuously asking them to upgrade their systems where if students uh, write something using AI, like for instance, uh, I have copied an entire paragraph from, let's say, a chat GPT, and I presented this as a part of my assignment. You will be immediately caught um, because... They, we, they have a collaboration. We have, a, you know, this uh, uh, tie up with regard to Turnitin. So uh, this organization that is um, Shikshak and its third party integration with Turnitin helps us detect that so-and-so student, Falana student has basically got 51% AI count or less than 10% AI count. So we can know this beforehand itself. So this is an integration possible with Blackboard Learn, right? It actually helps us with these third party integrations. Then there's another platform called Canvas. I'm just discussing few of them, okay? Canvas, it is not Canva, this is Canvas, okay? So Canvas is also very, very user-centric. 
it is very effective in the case of both iOS and Android both. And it's also known for its uh, use of, you know, these collaborative programs. It has got these wonderful whiteboard, you know, uh, uh, modules and, you know, where people can brainstorm and come together and, you know, have a wonderful spirited discussion. So this is very much possible. And one of the highlights of Canvas, I'll, I'll show it to you in the next slide, is, is this, um, you know, the speed grader. It basically helps, uh, it's, it's an AI platform, I guess, they, that they use. Or a, uh, I shouldn't use the word AI. It's actually an automated system that they use for grading uh, their uh, participants, right? Have a look at this. So this is a, an opening portal. This is the opening page of that, uh, you know, um, Canvas, as I was talking about. There are several platforms or parameters available out here. You can see there's a calendar where you can mark your uh, courses. There's a dashboard where you can see all the stuff that is needed you know, for you. Um, there is an inbox where you can get messages from your students or other faculty members as and when required. There is a comments option where you can you know, have a discussion with uh, people. There is a debate board out here. And more importantly, as I was talking about, this uh, idea of assessment. Assessment is very critical out here. No? So they use a technique or there is a tool called speed grader, right? So for example, a student has submitted an assignment. This is just a few dummy names included out here. So for example, somebody called Emily Boone has uploaded an assignment, right? So after you've downloaded the assignment and you've seen the assignment, what you can do is using uh, the online, the speed grader facility, you can easily trace their, you know, uh, marks, uh, you know, online. It is very much possible. Sometimes it's a quiz. It can be a quiz attempt or it could also involve an assignment, a detailed assignment where keywords need to be mentioned as long as the keywords with or without correct spellings feature in the answer, they will definitely get across a particular percentage mark. So this speed grader technique actually makes a canvas uh, really, you know, stand apart from other tools and techniques, right? So in addition to this, there are several more very similar kinds of modules as well. In fact, as we speak, new, new technologies are coming up. That is why I keep on mentioning with software, that is not important. What is more important is how do I use it to my advantage? I love this idea of speed reader, which is what fascinated me. The moment I saw this, since I also happened to be the you know head of uh, the PIC of this particular uh, department in my college, I immediately made it a point to go to my departmental head, that my vice principal basically, and tell them that I need to speak to these guys at you know the LMS that we have, that is Shiksha. And we also want a similar kind of a speed grading technique because we deal with so many students, assignments, seminars all the time. So it is not possible for us to keep on tallying you know, all the reports from time to time. So what if there was an automated system that is something like this, where the system would actually generate the, the percentage, right? But they would generate a grade. We do not want the students to land up with, let's say, 60% marks. We do not want marks to come in, but the grades. And based on the grade, if it comes down below a certain level, then we will deal with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. We call this in management a tool called, a technique called management by exception. So this platform actually helps us manage students by exception more than anything else. Right? So anyway, so these are uh, basically some of the tools that we primarily use in the context of um, online learning, right? Now, remember our content for discussion today is not only online learning platforms, but it is also how do we use video conferencing platforms as a part of it, right? So my job right now is to integrate video conferencing tools, different kinds of video conferencing tools in the context of what we have learned, like Moodle, Blackboard Learn, etc. right? So all of these more or less support a virtual classroom. There's a possibility of video conferencing for all of these tools, right? Now, how do we use this? Like for instance, this particular session, to the best of my knowledge is being recorded, right? Now, how do we use this recording is a big question. Now, uh, in case, for example, I am taking down notes uh, while writing or while you know, the session is, you know, being the recorded session is in progress. So I may miss out a part of the lecture and et cetera. These things can happen. So if there's a possibility of having something like, let's say a, a collective or a community note uh, builder, wherein um, it could either be in one of two ways. One is a group of people decide to you know, write a particular portion down, whereas another group of people prefer to write down something, something else. The whole session is broken down into several modules and you can take down the notes as per convenience. Alternatively, the notes are pre-generated from the content being delivered. 
right? So text to speech kind of a module is often used. So that can also be another type of recording, right? So Moodle unfortunately does not provide text to speech uh, as of now. Blackboard Learn also does not. Canvas, if I'm not wrong, is trying to experiment with this idea of real term, uh, real time note taking. So can you imagine the advantage if this is now implemented? We can have all meetings online and where um, the minutes of the meeting can be automated. It can be taken automatically. Yes, there will be a lot of challenges out here. For example, if I'm mumbling right now, if it is not very clear to you, then I don't think the uh, the tool that is used to record and you know uh, transcribe will do a lot of justice to it, right? So there are challenges, there are limitations, but technology is increasing and expanding every single day. So that is why we need to continually need to integrate and upgrade, right? So some of the features of these third-party integrations are also mentioned out here. Like for example, uh, when it comes to Blackboard Learn, there's an option of single sign-in. So it uses Blackboard credentials, right? So single sign-on rather. So you don't have to worry about, you know, forgetting your password details and all that. So it's a one-time logon and the subsequent accounts, uh, you can easily, you know, connect from your uh, email or, you know, whatever it is, right? So there are several advantages that each of these platforms typically tend to offer. Right. So this is about how we integrate video conferencing tools so that we can connect live with our audiences. I spoke only about the recording component. There are many more things like, for example, interaction. So when I'm interacting with you, I also want to write down something on the screen. So there's a scope for annotations right now. But for this, I can also use Zoom as a platform. Zoom is also a good example where I can annotate something live while delivering a session and you will be able to see that annotation on your on your screens. However, there are platforms like Google Meet and all which need to upgrade themselves a bit to provide these sorts of advanced features. Annotations and all require a third party app so that you know uh, they can be reached to their target audience via Google Meet. So this is how we can integrate video conferencing tools. Okay. Let's take a little bit of a breather. You know, I've been talking on and on for a long time. Let's take a little bit of a breather. I hope all of you have been listening into the session that we've been having. I understand it's, it's Yes, sir. It's theoretical. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So we'll have a small little quiz right now. What I'll do is I even though theoretical, it is interesting. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I will share with you a particular quiz link. Okay. Uh, which I want you to access. This is applicable to all of you. And this will also give me an input with regard to, you know, see, this is how uh, uh, you as a professor in your classrooms will also trace classroom participation, right? So um, this is the quiz that, where is it? Uh, just a second. Yeah, this is the one, right? So this is the quiz that I uh, had in mind. Uh, just a second. Let me start the quiz from my end. I, I hope the screen is visible. Even if it is not, it shouldn't be a problem. So it's a visible. Okay, thank you. So uh, this is basically what you are supposed to do. In your respective devices, you can use your mobile phone. If you are, unless of course you're using a mobile phone to join join or uh, log in. If you're joining in from your laptop or your device or something, and something and about, what you can do is you can just enter this website, joinmyquiz.com. And when you click on this website, okay, this is a continuous name, okay? And once you are uh, entering that particular website, then you'll be asked to give a code. The code is also on the screen, right? It's 493684, okay? So all that you need to do is go to this website, joinmyquiz.com and just enter the code that is mentioned out there. If you want, there's a small QR code out here as well. If you ask me, I can expand on this so that you can also you know, uh, scan the QR code and join in, okay? I can already see participants joining in. I would encourage that you enter your real name, not uh, fabricated names, so that we can all understand, you know, this. It is not, we are not uh, students in that sense where, where we'll get marks. So please do enter your real names uh, and uh, we can all have a little bit of a spirited competition this way. Right, so I can see three participants having logged in already. I have just opened my laptop. It takes some time. Please, please, please take your time, sir. Yeah, now you can see participants now slowly, slowly, you know, logging in. It will be a little bit faster if you can just use the scan the QR code. However, you can uh, do a, go about this traditionally. We will start when we have more participants uh, joining in. 
we've got seven people uh, logging in as of now. See, uh, I think uh, Kostov sir, if I'm not wrong, spoke about gamification of a classroom. If you really want to create a quiz, uh, we can traditionally create a quiz on a chalkboard, right? Uh, and then uh, we can all maybe do this manually. Alternatively, what we can do is uh, we can uh, use a Google form and share it with our students and ask them to complete it or maybe Microsoft uh, forms as such. But this is a platform uh, called quizzes wherein the same quiz, exactly the same thing is done in a little bit different manner, right? So that's how it is. It just gamifies the setup a little bit, right? All right, so I think people are logging in. I can see uh, participants slowly, slowly entering this particular uh, chat room uh, by clicking on the website or entering the website name that is joinmyquiz.com. Uh, excuse me, sir. Yeah, please go ahead, sir. Uh, sir, can you please share the link in the chat box as well? In the chat box, all right. Yeah. I'll do that. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Sir, please share the code once, sir. I will do the... Uh, I'll just copy this and paste it in the uh, chat box. There's some number there, no? Yeah. So the website name is joinmyquiz.com and the code is also mentioned therein. That is 493684. 493684. That's your OTP, basically, you can see. Right. So we've got around 15 participants. Let us start the quiz. You can otherwise those of uh, no, not yet, uh, you know, uh, you know, put in their uh, details. They can, you know, see from the chat box itself and they can go ahead. All right. So uh, can I get a quick uh, uh, response from the house? If you can go ahead with the quiz, can we start? Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. So I'm starting the quiz. I think it should be visible at your end. This is my admin console, right? So this is what I'm getting to see. You will get to see something else. All the best. And let's see who's the winner. Yeah, which of the following platform is an inactive initiative by the So if I can understand right, I have uh, Alif, uh, if, if I'm saying the name right, leading a little bit from now. We need more participants to beat, uh, you know, in terms of competition. We have now got uh, Sahanovas uh, coming up slowly, slowly. But the highest in terms of score is still Alif as of now. Let's see if anybody is able to uh, defeat the competition. But I'm really impressed by the fact that the house has got a 65 more than 50% accuracy. That means you're hitting the right answers. Right. So let's see if uh, we can have a winner as such. We've got 24 participants and the class accuracy has now gone up to an impressive 71% or 72 right now. Okay, so this is very interesting. So we've got a new winner now. We've got a new score in town uh, that is from uh, Sahanovas, if I'm seeing the name right. Uh, let's see if anybody else is able to uh, pitch in with a new score. So this particular quiz actually takes into account both uh, time, time taken for answering each question vis-a-vis -vis the whether the answer is correct or not. And plus, what is your score in relation to others? So it's not just about me answering all the questions. So it's like your Khan Manega Karurpati, that first finger, what is a finger first? Uh, I forgot the, uh, the name of that. But whoever gives it first related to the others. 
So you're still seeing participants coming in uh, with regard to the quiz and it'll go on, right? So the leaderboard, if I see the top five, have I just tried to pause the quiz out here? Sir, all done. Wonderful, sir. So um, if I see the winners right now, if I see the top five participants, because the quiz is already or is still in progress, there are other people still taking the quiz. I can see that the class accuracy is really impressive. It's I mean, the, the participants are uh, really having a very strong accuracy, the right hits. Um, so congratulations to uh, Sahanovas, uh, um, uh, that if I'm saying the name right, followed by uh, Professor Alif and then uh, uh, Swaroop sir, then Gustav sir and Antara ma'am. I think uh, all of us, all of you have done a great job. These are the top five uh, scores in terms of the questions that have been there, right? So the questions basically have been with regard to whatever uh, we are discussing and whatever we are, you know, uh, in the process of discussing today, right? So it's just repackaged to you, to you in the form of this particular quiz. So I hope all of you found this little quiz interesting. I think um, those, if you're still continuing with the quiz, please go ahead and complete it. Uh, absolutely fine. Uh, yeah, wonderful. Thank you for taking the quiz. Right, so let's move forward. So we will come back from the quiz now. We will come back to our discussion once again. The quiz was just to take a little bit of a breather in between uh, our session. Wonderful um, uh, to uh, Professor Amrita. So you got a redemption question as well. Uh, yeah. I got the 8 out of 27. Okay, okay, sir. That's absolutely no problem. Uh, your score should show up here as well. This is what I'm getting to see. Uh, this is the admin console. So I can see uh, sir's name. I think I probably skipped it up. Yeah, your name is here, sir. So 4,000. It's not a bad score, actually. Very high score. 4,590. Anything above 4,000 is actually a very good score. But unfortunately, as of now, as I can see, if you look at the top five, there is no change in the top uh, top scores. So hopefully another new participant is going to come in and probably break the record. Nonetheless, so let's come back to our uh, discussion one more time uh, with regard to online and virtual programs. Now we will just move to the portion on video conferencing, right? So we'll just start discussing about video conferencing and how this is uh, so relevant. See, uh, video conferencing, I uh, as, a, as a child, for the first time I learned about video conferencing when I was in school and, and in, uh, in primary school. When I remember my father would tell me that he would often you know, do these business meetings sometimes with the clients abroad, but that was using a computer and a device. And uh, you would use that dial-up computer, you know, that was a huge procedure, that video conferencing program was a huge procedure that his organization had to undertake uh, you know, to communicate to clients abroad, right? So I, I, I still remember that example that you would often tell me. That was my first experience of, you know, understanding or, I mean, rather hearing what a video conference is. Who knew that in the years to come, video conferencing would become a part and parcel of our everyday lives, right? So today we have um, the fact that I can chat and communicate with you on WhatsApp via video is itself a video conference for itself. Video conferencing does not necessarily mean, um, you know, uh, a classroom lecture. It is ultimately where uh, we can engage with our target audiences, which is basically students, and facilitate a real-time engagement with them, both through audio and video interaction. That is where video conferencing steps in and where it comes in in a big way, right? So we need to talk about some of the... We'll, we'll first do one thing. We will first talk about the different platforms that are available for... Uh, video conferencing and then we will continue our uh, discussion we'll move forward to um, the different uh, challenges and all these things that are there and all the various features that are there right so I will not get into too much of detail about what this is uh, and all that since it's a, just a two-hour session I unfortunately cannot go into you know the nitty-gritties of everything like you know um, in this sense so that is why I am trying to give you an overall theoretical understanding of this right Zoom is actually one of the best platforms, undoubtedly, that exists in this particular market. And uh, instead of just get, telling you what Zoom is, let me tell you some of the features of Zoom. Because since it's already recorded, this particular session, you can use these benefits to your advantage later. Okay. So the first and the biggest advantage that Zoom tends to present is uh, the fact that it has um, an immersive view. It pre presents, a, creates a more, um, you know, cohesive classroom experience 
that is one of the biggest advantages of Zoom. The Zoom is typically used by many colleges and universities for their classroom lectures as well. Why? Because of this immersive view. If all our videos are on right now, I can get to see all of us and I can interact with anybody at random. So uh, in the, or in other words, I am at, at my home and you are all of you are seated in one particular place. I can get to see all of you right now. Right. So if this is basically where, you know, it helps me connect with you virtually, remotely, anywhere. So be it a lecture hall, be it a seminar room, be it a library. Um, I create a visually unified space. That is the advantage of Zoom. Right. So, um, for example, rather than seeing students in usual grid format, I can set up a virtual classroom. This can also be done on MS Teams and, and other platforms as well. You know, in a uh, virtual classroom, what I do is I will essentially recreate the background that I typically have in my classroom and I will place the students' faces in those respective places. There we're creating a virtual classroom altogether. So it is not necessary that I have to have these boxes all, to, all together for myself. That's an immersive view. So as a, as a professor, there's a big advantage for me. You see, um, how do I, how do I say it? Uh, when I'm discussing a topic that benefits from close interactions not or not all discussions, you know, these kinds of interactions can be done great using, uh, you know, virtual tools, but something that needs close interaction, like workshop, like a hands-on workshop or a case discussion. So it needs actually, we need a setting for this, right? So, um, it needs to resemble an actual classroom. So when I discuss case studies in the classroom, I usually tend to move about a lot, interact with people, tend to do this a lot. But here I cannot move around. So what if the platform allowed me to move through various places? So for example, the platform has something called um, a breakout room. So all of us can be broken down into distinct groups and effectively I can navigate through the different rooms one after the other, if probably randomly. So the advantage is that I can actually use it in a much more better manner sometimes as compared to what I would get in a classroom. In a classroom, it becomes a fish market sometimes when you tend to break them into groups and they start discussing, it Bye might become question. it might become a little bit inconvenient sometimes, especially to keep a tally with regard to what is being discussed. But here I have complete liberty and full control with regard to what is being covered and what is not, right? So this is one of the things. I can also conduct polls from time to time. So th there are several advantages of Zoom. One of the biggest advantages is the polling system. In the polling system, what I can do is I can, while the session is going on, I can actually figure out, you know, whether you are all liking the session or not. So, uh, <laughs> so in this particular manner, uh, with the polling system, I can track student engagement and. <laughs> Right. So I would really appreciate if you are on mute, uh, the participants. Thank you. So um, th in this way, I could use ranking polls. For example, which students, uh, you know, for example, agree with this? I give you two options. And then I, I see which one is the highest one. And then I go ahead with that particular option, something like this. So I can see the data almost instantaneously. So this provides an advanced polling system. It actually helps me, gives, you a lot, gives me a lot of insights about trends, activities, etc. Right. So that's the thing for uh, advanced polling uh, as a feature in Zoom. Then Zoom allows me to use um, AI power transcriptions. AI power transcriptions means it gives me real time captions. So this particular session right now can also be, uh, you know, can also if I if I speak English properly and if I enunciate properly, it can actually transcribe whatever is being said right now. So essentially, all of these will be pre-session, pre-saved, or sorry, saved separately, and they can be presented to you in a word format, right? So all of you will have basically written content, which I have been talking about all this while. So real-time captions actually help us a lot. This is one of the biggest advantages of having Zoom, right? So creates a searchable transcript. So for example, so and so professor spoke about let's say advanced polling at eight twenty-five. So a student can easily search for advanced polling and easily get that particular transcript immediately, right? That is the advantage. So um, in this way, I can save a lot of time. I can actually save a lot of time. I can, uh, you know, it makes it easy for me when I have a written record of the lecture. So otherwise you have to write down everything manually, right? So this is why Zoom remains one of the strongest and the biggest platforms for video conferencing. And it will remain so in the years to come. It is my uh, best guess, right? I strongly and firmly believe that, you know, um, 
your uh, Zoom will remain one of the strongest platforms to use. We will not discuss all platforms. There are several thousands platforms probably that exist for video conferencing uh, purposes, but we are only going to consider the best ones which are used in the context of online learning, right? So for teaching and um, teaching and development, if you were all business people out here or we are all corporates out here, you would probably be using some different other platforms, some other platforms which uh, you know would be would be found relevant, uh, which would find its relevance. Um, so here we are talking about a, a platform which is probably one of the most commonly used ones called MS Teams, Microsoft Teams. It did have its fair share of problems in the beginning, this platform, Microsoft Teams. Um, but in the recent past, especially since uh, the last couple of years, MS Teams has really, really upgraded its services, right? So MS Teams actually helps combine chat, you know, uh, audio, video, file storage, application integration. It actually facilitates integration in this entire teamwork into one place. It is a semi LMS, you can say almost like a semi, you know, uh, quasi LMS of sorts. So this is why it is very popular among businesses, especially education institutions, people who are remotely studying um, competitive for competitive exams or otherwise. So they find a lot of relevance in MS Teams. You'll find MS Teams more popular among education institutions than uh, for businesses, while Zoom more popular among businesses than as compared to educational institutions. And this transition has happened in the last two years. Right. So um, Microsoft has uh, gone through a lot of controversies in the past, but one of its advantages is now it's Microsoft uh, Office 365 package, the full package. So when you integrate them, see um, uh, all together, you need to provide seamless access to all the essential teaching tools. So Microsoft Teams is deeply integrated with Office 365. Now it allows me as a teacher, it allows maybe students to access Word, Excel, PowerPoint, OneNote, um, what else, uh, SharePoint, all these things directly within one platform itself. So the advantage is what I can use a whiteboard while teaching something while conducting a lecture, or maybe uh, one student can take down notes on a real time basis using OneNote, Microsoft MS OneNote, or maybe I can make a PowerPoint presentation and display it integrated along with uh, MS Teams platform. Right. So uh, from I, I do not have to separately uh, go to MS Teams all over again from PowerPoint itself. I can present it directly to MS Teams to my target audiences. So that is the integration that we're talking about with Office 365. So this I had to write down as one of the biggest features or one of the biggest advantages of this particular uh, platform. OK, so uh, as a professor, for example, I could share a PowerPoint presentation on Teams. And I can invite students to add their thoughts on specific slides during a lecture. So students can have direct access to those slides. They can be given a separate Excel sheet, which is also integrated within the platform and they can write down their inputs in their Excel sheet. And I can also grade it while it is going, going in. Gradation is of course done manually. Right? So this is basically about integration with Office 365. Then next we're talking about AI noise suppression. See, AI is basically a, a blessing and a, you know curse both at the same time. If you use it in the best possible manner, there is nothing better than AI in the future. Um, this, uh, I mean, the sky is the limit. But the way in which we are, you know, using, uh, you know, your uh, AI uh, platforms nowadays, it is telling us that we are using using less of our brain. We are not thinking much. There was a time when people would at least think about certain things before writing down. Today, before thinking about stuff, they put in the topic uh, into ChatGPT. I'm just giving ChatGPT as an example. AI does not mean ChatGPT. Uh, they put the topic on uh, ChatGPT and ask them to you know generate responses. So, our, our is our ability to uh, you know uh, is our ability to think gradually becoming you know uh, confined every single day? Real question. So, in this context, uh, MS Teams platform uh, has this AI noise suppression feature that detects uh, all these background noises, like you know. Um, uh, for example, um, uh, let me give you the practical ones. The AI that I talked about right now is a bit different. What uh, what MS Teams does is, imagine that I'm typing right, right now something, right? When I'm typing, there's a lot of sound that comes in from the typing. Or for example, there is a lot of construction work going on in the back end. So those sounds are often muted. Or if you're in a, in a let's say, uh, an assembly room, when there's a lot of chatter around the room, right? So that is often muted. 
So MS Teams actually has provided a lot of this clarity in you know voice audio uh, content, right? So this is helping you maintain a quieter, more focused classroom environment. We were recently in our campus. We had our NAC visit, and during our NAC visit, as you know very well, you know we cannot take leaves, and we were having our classes as well. So and unfortunately, my you know class uh, classes coincided along with the uh, this uh, program. Then the NAC team, while they were you know like they when they were visiting our department. So unfortunately, I cannot cancel classes because that will send a wrong impression. So um, my team was there, of course. My team of faculty members were there, and I joined them before the uh, the NAC team came in, right? When I was taking the class, the class was uh, taken in a room where there were more than fifty plus people sitting down there. They were all talking to each other, chatting. It was a communal room. It's not that I could not go to my cubicle and take a session from there, but then I had to go all the way to the top, you know, the second floor, and then come down again when needed. I thought of taking the class from there itself. I'm not in. I'm not making this up. The students really said that you know the sound quality is good enough. They could understand that there are people in the back end. It's not that it's hundred percent foolproof, but they could hear my voice loud and clear. But I sometimes I could hear other people's chatter around me. So this is where uh, uh, Microsoft has really really worked a lot uh, to you know provide a very seamless you know sound experience. AI noise suppression. This is the sound I'm talking about, right? And what I was talking about AI is basically um, um, in the context of Chat GPT. Uh, in a, that is a different context altogether, right? So in a classroom, for example, this is really really great. I can take the class from a cafe. I can take it from any place for that matter. Then a library, if necessary. And uh, in MS Teams, there's something called a together mode. That's very important. So you can create a cohesive virtual classroom feel. So there are these artificial seats that are placed over there, and uh, where you have students' faces. The students' faces will simply be placed on those chairs, right on those seats. So it feels as if I am actually talking to a live classroom, uh, you know, filled with people. So this is the together mode that you know MS Teams actually has that actually gives you a great feeling. It feels as if I am delivering to an auditorium filled with people, right? So uh, that's very very advantages for advantages for large classrooms. I think earlier there was a capacity of twenty five. They've expanded that to fifty now, and now it's, I think it's gone up to more than fifty, if I'm not wrong, right? See, uh, th see, the thing is, uh, as professors, we can use the together mode during group discussions a lot. This is actually very effective. It really feels like a GD, right? So it actually gives students the impression that they are sitting side by side. That is the advantage. So it actually encourages interaction and it reduces that so-called what is it called virtual fatigue. So it is very effective sometimes in interactive sessions and classes. Very very effective this. So this is where you have a advantage for. Microsoft Teams. The next one is something that is probably the most popular one because it's free, right? Even Zoom is expensive because you have to pay a subscription for the the business version, uh, the the premium version that is. Same for MS Teams, but Google Meet as of now continues to remain free to the best of my knowledge, and it is actually very effective. I I personally sometimes feel uh, that you know Google Meet has made a life so easy. Because sometimes when it comes to my you know um, students uh, the, the the people that I'm guiding sometimes PhD students or maybe you know other students when I'm you know uh, dealing with them, um, uh, they have a submission due tomorrow. For example, there's an REC meeting coming up very 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 soon. Uh, instead of you know waiting for the next day in campus, which is traditionally how it was done, I can have a meeting with them at eleven thirty at night or twelve o'clock at night, without having to worry about anything. I know that our discussions are secure in Google Meet. That is the biggest advantage. Security is one of the hallmarks of Google Meet, and it's so fast. So all that I tell them is, you know, just set up a meeting. You know, just send me a meeting link. I'll join in. I can join in from any of my Google accounts, whatever I want to. It's so fast. So Google Meet is actually very very effective. However, there uh, must be some caution that may that may be exercised when conducting this in an online classroom setup. Because we have used Google Meet for online classes as well, we have found that you know unless of course we are using the pro version of Google Meet, which is for a larger audience, I don't think it is as effective as compared to MS Teams. There are some areas where Google Meet is actually lagging behind because Google Meet was never developed to the intention of online teaching and learning. It was developed to the intention of online discussions. That is why it's a meeting. That was their answer to you know social networking basically networking purposes. 
So you'll find Google Meet very popular among youngsters, among people who are business people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I will not say it is never used, but relatively lesser used uh, during online classes. That is Google Meet. So as I said very clearly in the beginning, one of the biggest advantages of Google Meet is its facility for uh, your um, this thing security, enhanced security. So there are multiple layers which actually help secure the content that we are deliberating upon um, uh, from time to time. Then uh, we have uh, the feature of breakout rooms, which is actually in the pipeline, by the way. You know, it's not yet, you know, roll this out. Um, this is going to come on. This is, if this happens, if a Google Meet is definitely be, uh, going to become one of the toughest nuts to break. So um, uh, they are trying out this particular idea where you can have breakout rooms to segregate the classes into different sections or different rooms, uh, groups. And then we can have discussions for each and every group as such, right? So this is how breakout rooms will become definitely one of the biggest hallmarks. And uh, there are many integrations we can do. Uh, Google Meet, uh, the thing is that it has its limitations, but it, all, it, it covers up for those limitations because of its integration facility. You can connect to the whiteboard, you can connect to the Jamboard, you can do whatever you want to. So Jamboard is basically for brainstorming, interactive brainstorming purposes, right? So Google Meet actually integrates seamlessly with Google Jamboard, which is one of their platforms itself. It's a virtual whiteboard app, right? This Jamboard. And it allows, as a participant, allows me to brainstorm, draw, and add sticky notes on a real-time basis, right? So that is the advantage of using Google Meet, right? So this, I think, is very common and known to all of us. And the last one we can talk about, uh, four I have shortlisted. There are many more. But I feel that these four in the Indian context have seen a lot of success, right? That is why these four, okay? So WebEx by Cisco is also very, very popular. It used to be very complicated earlier. This was very popular. This was a hot favorite among business people, especially in the IT teams. It used to be very popular for uh, global coordination, global you know, uh, discussions. So even WebEx, uh, Cisco WebEx is very, very popular because uh, it is a, a online uh, collaboration pro uh, platform and it is designed to facilitate seamless communication with uh, not only businesses, but also with educational institutions, as well as you and me as an individual. So these uh, WebEx accounts can actually, if used properly, um, this will become very, very effective as compared to even Google Meet and the other platforms. So WebEx, actually the biggest advantage of WebEx is its size, uh, you know, um, uh, maybe I'll say it's, it's advantage and disadvantage both. Webex can track a large number of people, a, a large uh, data full of, you know, filled with people, filled with people. But uh, Webex uh, is, the only problem is that it becomes a little bit slow from time to time, given its, you know, huge size, right? So uh, there are perils, pros, pros and cons to anything for that matter, right? So that's about um, uh, the concept of, you know, where we use Webex. But see, um, again, just like Google Meet, this one also enjoys very, very strong security features. It ensures Google, uh, unlike Google, uh, sorry, um, even for Google, you can record it, right? So Google allows you, like for instance, there are several websites. If you go, you cannot take a screenshot because of its high security policy. Uh, for Google Meet, it is possible for you to record the session. There are tricks. I will not name the tricks on record, but there are ways by which you can record the session um uh, while it's in progress right but um for webex if the session cannot be taken uh if you cannot record the session then you cannot record the session unless of course you have a mobile phone for recording it that's a separate issue right so it uses a lot of these advanced double layered security for um uh, creating uh you know for, for example for ensuring secure access to password protection so only the right people enter the meeting uh meeting locks can be created right Participant authentication can be created, face recognition and all that, right? So this will help me protect my student data. Very important, right? So this is the first advantage. Second is, uh, I have written virtual background, you know, because there are, uh, I mean, WebEx uh, by itself, this is the biggest feature. Gesture recognition is its biggest feature. Virtual background is very, very foolproof. It actually does not move a lot. Like, for example, Google Meet, if I used a virtual background, people could easily understand that I'm hiding my background, right? It's it's not very, you know, it's very blurry. After a point of time, when you move a little bit, you know, your head moves a little bit here and there, the background becomes visible. But in WebEx, if you have decided that, you know, that your background will remain uh, muted, then your background will definitely be muted, right? So that's one of the advantages. And finally, we can talk about gesture recognition. 
in gesture recognition as i spoke about like for example we can use these physical gestures to communicate like thumbs up clapping hand raising this is also one of the advantages so wherein i can connect with you this is now available in ms teams also on zoom also in all platforms they are very effective across all platforms so um, yeah so that is what it is mm, let me see if you think uh, chatboard yeah, so Jamboard is actually, uh, I will not use the word discontinued, but it is actually not integrated. Uh, the integration facility is no longer there, right? So actually Google is experimenting, you know, um, the G Suite, as we talk about, is now getting updated. That is why you have to wait and watch probably in the next year itself, in this year itself, 2025, that is the next year, they will be bundling up with their new, you know, new facility. So that will be your Google Meet 2.0, right? That's a new version altogether. So this is anyway, so this is just a summary of all the platforms that are used for uh, video conferencing. Now, before we draw to a close, I want to close. There are several other platforms as well. For example, you have Spatial Chat, you have Gather, which is a very effective platform uh, as well. Then there is Blue Big Button, which is, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, Big Blue Button, which is now becoming very, very popular. Big, uh, Big Blue Button is also open source. So this is also very effective, but there are some limitations to each of these, hence, um, the reach is relatively confined sometimes, right? So anyway, so these are some of the platforms we can talk about. We have many more than this, other than this, but this is not a uh, platform or this is not the right forum where we go on discussing names of video conferencing platforms. Our objective is to find out how it can be used to our advantage. So now that I've talked about all these tools and uh, uh, to techniques, let us see what are some of the interactive tools of video conferencing and how they are used by Zoom or by MS Teams or by uh, Cisco, WebEx, etc., etc., right? So some of the interactive tools of video conferencing involve polls and quizzes. This can be done on Zoom also. This can be done on Google Meet also. Um, uh, because of uh, Google Workspace, you know, because of this idea, they can, you know, uh, I mean, connect or integrate the Google form as a part of the chat itself, right? And you can participate in polls and quizzes from time to time. Even MS Teams has rolled out this particular feature where while the session is in progress, you can conduct a real-time poll to figure out if the feedback is, you know, in, in, in your order or not, right? Real-time feedback is enabled. If this is true for all, okay, breakout rooms. Breakout rooms, except for, I think, Google Meet, all the other ones, all the other platforms have their own Google breakout rooms. It is very effective when it comes to discussions. Like in this particular session itself, we wanted to conduct a breakout room. I can do that easily by dividing people into four or five groups. I do not even have to select you. Like for instance, I give Google a command, I beg your pardon, uh, Zoom a command that you form your own groups randomly. So five people uh, from this particular entire team will be randomly allotted to one group and then others into other groups accordingly. So it will figure it out on its own. So that is one of the hallmarks of Zoom. Even for MS Teams, this is a very similar feature, not much of a difference. In M we have to wait and watch for Google Board, uh, sorry, pardon, Google Meet to figure out what they are up to, right? Screen sharing, I'm not uh, referring to because this is very obvious. Annotation tools. If you use a tool called a pen tab, pen tab will actually help you, uh, you know, like write down on the screen as you go along, right? So there are many people who are very comfortable, you know, like writing down, like chalk and talk, as we call it, chalk and talk method of teaching. So if you want to write down something out here, it can easily be done using one of this, uh, you know, one of these annotation tools, right? So you can use a pen tab to write down as you speak about something. Okay. Then you have file sharing, which is very much, you know, very much common to both, uh, you know, um, Google Meet as well as um, MS Teams. Zoom uh, actually uh, allows users to share files directly into the meeting chat. So through the chat itself. But in MS Teams, if you want, you can create a separate account for this. Like for instance. I want only people of this particular group to access my account. So I will create a separate account with my details. And within this, you will find this particular uh, note or whatever it is, file. So that's file sharing advantage in the context of MS Teams. So in my opinion, MS Teams leads the pack. It's the best of all the ones that are available. Even uh, WebEx is not bad. There is recording facility. Uh, unfortunately, Google Meet needs uh, an extension right now. But the other sessions can be recorded quite easily. Participant reactions we spoke about, it can be captured. Live captioning is only possible right now on two platforms. One is your uh, WebEx and the other one is Zoom. These platforms allow you for live captioning, which is very tricky and very difficult. Right? 
the next one is collaboration tools. We're almost near the end of our discussion. We are already aware of these things. Um, the next one is what we refer to as um, collaboration tools. Now, our objective is to collaborate with people and I want a group of people to come together. So for this, now I need to use shared whiteboards, right? Whiteboard is this common whiteboard on the screen, but all of you will have access to the same whiteboard at the same point of time. Allow me to give you a better example of this. Um, you don't have to, this is not a video conferencing tool. This is called a Padlet, right? A Padlet allows you to create the same concept, right? So for example, I conduct, uh, when I do my dissertations for both masters and, uh, uh, and UG, I ask my students to give me a few testimonials, like about their feedback and not words of praise, whatever feedback that they have, right? So now this link I share with my students and all that they have to do is just write in that particular tab and everybody has access to this, right? So anybody can write about it. The thing is that it is on a real time basis. So this is what happens in a virtual uh, platform as well, video conferencing platform as well. So uh, shared whiteboards allow you to do this. Okay. Uh, this is another uh, breakout rooms we spoke about. Co annotation means three people are writing on the same board simultaneously. And where are you writing that? On a shared whiteboard, right? Whiteboard is exactly what it comes to, right? Then a screen, then there is uh, screen sharing, shared media playback, polling and surveys can also be done. Chat functions are there. See, when you talk about integrated functions, the last one is very important, last two in particular. Participant management. Zoom actually provides the host. Uh, Zoom provides um, the host and the co-host. There are two categories with a range of participant management tools. Like for example, I can choose to mute you if I want to, or I can remove you as a participant. I can control uh, permissions. MS Teams also does exactly the same thing, right? I can also see whether I want to give you mic access or, uh, or let's say um, your video access. If I want then, you cannot switch on your video. If I if I tell you not to switch on a video on MS Teams, I can control or restrict that access. Same is possible in Zoom as well. In Google Meet, I cannot go to this extent and I can just mute participants at all, at most, right? I can control their screen sharing permissions. In Google Meet, it's a matter of one after the other, one ikke badik, this kind of a concept. So once I'm done participating, presenting, uh, others can, you know, supersede. And if I do not put in restrictions, while my session is being, you know, uh, while I'm sharing my screen, if somebody else is sharing the screen, his or hers will supersede mine. So this is some of, these are some of the limitations of the Google Meet platform, which probably they will be looking into eventually. The last point is integration with third party apps. Let me first talk about MS Teams. That is very effective. See, uh, if you want to um, integrate your app with, uh, let's say, uh, let's say project management, you want to do this for project management. So there's this company called Trello, T-R-E-L-L-O, Trello, by which you can integrate the app for project management purposes. You can create uh, Gantt charts. You can create, uh, create you know, all these uh, platforms for assessing at what time you're supposed to complete a program and all that, right? So that is there. The data visualization programs, like for example, Power BI is becoming very popular nowadays. Power BI can be used for giving a complete data visualization approach. Uh, then we have a CRM platform, uh, customer relationship management wherein we can use uh, Salesforce and integrate Google Meet, uh, beg your pardon, Microsoft Teams along with Salesforce. That's a very, very big advantage, right? Uh, in Google Meet also, we can do a lot of things. Collaboration with, let's say, Google Cl Calendar, Google Docs, Google uh, Sheets, Google Slides. The entire Google ecosystem is in my hands. Uh, Zoom as well, same thing. I can collaborate with, you know, I can coordinate with uh, Google Calendar, Slack. Uh, there's this uh, platform called Kahoot, which can also be used for quizzing quizzing purposes, right? So that's another advantage. Uh, I can enhance the meeting experience with additional functionalities as such, right? So this is basically a bit uh, of an in input with regard to the collaboration part of it. The last part of my discussion today is uh, something that we've covered already. Um, that is accessibility features of video conferencing. What are the accessibility features? For example, things like live captions and subtitles present in Zoom, right? Not for so much for Google. Google also has this, by the way. In Google Meet also you can transcribe. But the only thing is that it is not very, very convincing. That is the only thing. Not extremely convincing. Uh, screen reader support is there in most cases, uh, all the ones. Multilingual support you will find uh, for Zoom. Um, it, has, it supports multiple languages in its user interface. And also there is something called a live language interpretation. So uh, as a host, 
when I'm conducting the session, I can assign interpreter, uh, interpreters to specific audio channels. So if there is someone uh, who's speaking in Russian, for example, I can get a real world or real time trans, uh, this, uh, translation. Right? So Google Meet also does this, but Google Meet has a limitation. So I think it, to the best of my knowledge, it's English, Spanish is there, uh, German, Portuguese. I, I don't remember the other one. So there's one more after this, right? So it's limited. And for Microsoft Teams, uh, it does support live captioning and all that. But whether it has um, um, this language needs and all that is not very, very convincing. English remains very popular, but other languages, whether it's effective or not, remains a question mark, actually, right? So multilingual support may not be there for MS Teams. So even there can be high contrast mode and visual adjustments. Like, for example, video is very bright, uh, may not be visible, so you can adjust it. Same for audio, uh, closed captioning. That means uh, as the session is going on, uh, it provides APIs, uh, you know, for uh, closed captioning, that is. So it allows me to integrate with third party transcription services. So Google Meet is there. Meet does not offer a closed captioning service at all. Uh, MS Teams offers again uh, APIs for closed captioning, right? So that is there. Uh, session recording, I have already talked about visual, audio vision notifications. So uh, last one is very important, cognitive uh, ac accessibility. See, uh, Zoom offers a simple inter intuitive interface uh, with cognitive disabilities, right? So it, uh, it helps me as a user, I do not feel overwhelmed. So as a host, for example, I can lock a meeting to prevent disruptions. So for example, it has happened in the past while a session is going on, somebody is scribbling on the screen because the annotation feature is open to all participants, right? So here I can lock that particular setting as an advantage. So cognitively, what is happening is I can focus and concentrate on the session on board, right? Google Meet offers a much more clear cut, straightforward approach, right? It has minimal distractions. So Google Meet is probably the best for discussions. Uh, MS Teams also provides some features like for example, the together mode, um, it reduces screen clutter. That's an advantage. It also has something called Microsoft's, uh, this thing, uh, immersive reader. Uh, it ensures that I can you know, enhance my text readability. So text spacing can be enhanced, increased, line focus can be there, zoomed in line focus, background color can be adjusted, dark mode and all that. So these are some of the accessibility features of video conferencing. So this is basically what I had to share with uh, all of us. You know, it's not that, you know, all of us are new to all of these things. My job here is that of a facilitator. My job is not uh, that of a uh, resource person in that sense. My, our job is just to revise recap and revise what we know already and come back to a sense of reality. But the point that I want all of us to take back is basically something that I really believe in and a lot. I always say this, that technology should not supersede human uh, learning and human knowledge. Technology is just a tool. It is just a video conferencing tool. It is just an online learning platform. It may be the best platform in the world, but that should not be greater than the cause of education. Ultimately, whatever be the cause, education is important. We may go to a place, for example, we can talk about the best trains in the world and the best airlines in the world. But ultimately, that airline is just a conduit. It is just a, a transportation medium to help me reach my destination. I remember what I did on my destination. The train or the aircraft is just a carrier to that destination. Here also, <clears throat> also the same thing happens. So on that note, uh, I would like to uh, end this uh, monologue rather from my side. And if there are any questions from the audience, um, you can please go ahead. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, Good evening. Sir, first of all, thank you very much for giving us such a wonderful insight about various tools. Thank Even you. like for me, certain tools are very new to me, which I came to know throughout the session. Uh, this is slightly... Uh, different from whatever has been discussed in the session actually i uh, beside your uh, session i i was actually going through the lms portal over there i was going through the activity 4 yeah okay so sir can you please give us a little idea about like how should we proceed about that activity because after reading it i what i understood is that it it has to be a team uh, submission or team project because of a couple of restroom technology uh, tools and other things were specified here. So if you can give us a little insight about Activity 4. Okay, okay, fine. Uh, 
uh, I initially had proposed or rather initially I thought about doing the session in the uh, like having that session within the forum itself, like while we were having this discussion. But the problem is that this is an FDP program. And if I were to do that in the context of this session, I would have taken more than one and a half hours. So that is why I thought otherwise. So uh, hence, now what we can do is let me just uh, share that particular file uh, with you. I'm pretty sure all of you have access to it. Uh, just give me a second, sir. Uh, this is the PDF. I hope the PDF is visible to all of us. This is the workshop activity. So what is most important here is uh, basically we have to create a course. Now, um, I would prefer now if this is done, um, I, I would really appreciate if this is done using some uh, group. Like for example, um, you can randomly select a group from the house. Like for example, if there are 50 participants out here, make five groups comprising 10 participants each. Okay. Now, uh, it is not necessary that all of you have to belong to the same field. Like for example, all the people, professors teaching computer science need to come together. All the professors teaching Paul science need to come together, although it would be really appreciable. But I would prefer a multidisciplinary approach where people from different backgrounds are coming together in one place. So, for example, in the same uh, group, if there is a participant from computer science, one from Paul science, one from sociology, one from engineering, whatnot, um, and they come together and they form a group, right? After this, you need to brainstorm. What I would request you is in the activity sheet itself, take screenshots of the fact that you are participating in a Zoom meeting or in a Google Meet, okay? Because uh, breakout rooms would have been possible if you were doing this in house, like while the session is in progress. But if you can form a group right now and together come come together, that is, and do a Google Meet with each other, right? Take pictures of the screenshots of the Google Meet where all of your faces and everything is visible and you're discussing, right? After that, something that I would encourage you is basically to have a collabor use a collaborative tool. Some of the best ones available I have written down in uh, brackets out here. You can use a Microsoft whiteboard or you can use a Google Docs, which is easy. But when you're using Google Docs, which three or four people or 10, 12 people can use at the same time, whatever you are writing, please ensure that you're writing your name in brackets or uh, in other words, for example, if I'm writing something right now, I will write Shonok Roy, colon, uh, and then I will write whatever I have to, so that I will know or people will know that this participant has written this, okay? That is for Google Docs. You can also use a tool called Padlet. Uh, I don't uh, know. I think this may be visible. You can also use a tool called Padlet out here, uh, which is also real time, right? It's a real on a real time basis. You can create, uh, you know, uh, a Padlet where everybody can pitch in and participate, right? This is also there uh, for and podcast there. also. Which one, sir? Podcast, storyteller, podcast. Yes, yes, yes. There are sky is the limit. There are so many platforms. Use any one platform. Oh. You have to use at least one collaboration tool and take a screenshot again for proof. Today, you understand that today is the era of documentation, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, that's just a proof that, you know, we have used some kind of a collaboration tool. What you need to discuss is basically what uh, course are we going to design? What lesson or topic are we going to provide, right? It does not have to be your subject. It does not necessarily have to be your subject. You can create a new subject altogether a fresh subject with maximum two or three lesson plans, uh, courses, sub courses, two or three modules rather, maximum two or three modules, not more than that. Okay. After that, um, you need to submit it as a PDF, take all the pictures and everything, put it in the PDF and uh, submit it. That's all that you need to do. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sonograi. My pleasure, sir. For an insightful lecture and truly interactive session, sir. There actually no question answer session will be needed after that. Still, I'm asking uh, the participants, please, if you have any question, more any more questions, please ask. Sir, but only dear, one or sir. Two. Yes. Simply aggressive, sir. Like Sachin Tendulkar and Virendra Savag. So marvelous. You, Means a lot. Yeah. Uh, right. Sir. Please, uh, please, ma'am, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to know uh, 
I missed it. Uh, Trello, what is, what is it? Uh, uh, you said it helps with God chats. Uh, is it a platform? Uh, Ma'am, are you talking about Padlet by any chance? I, I didn't catch that word you said. No, Trello. Trello, you said. Oh, oh tre uh, Trello, basically, ma'am, uh, this is basically a third-party app. So, uh, when uh, if you are using any of these, uh, what to say, um, uh, platforms like Zoom and all that, Trello is actually used for project management purposes. Like, for example, um, if I am uh, starting a project today and I want to end after one year, it will help me create Gantt charts. It will help me create, uh, let's say, a uh, list to do list it will help me create boards project it helps in project management ma'am okay thank you sir okay okay ma'am any more questions please okay, it is already out of time yeah thank thank you all the participants uh, to join uh, through the interactive thank session you, with, with professor sonogroy and uh, good night to everybody. And again, big round of applause for Dr. Sonogroy. It's a nice lecture and interactive Thank session. Thank you very much, Dr. Sonogroy. And we are waiting for the uh, collaboration in future, definitely. Definitely. definitely okay. So, <laughs> so everyone, uh, you, you can leave and we'll leave. Good night. Good night, Smoke, sir. Good night. Good night to good everyone. Night. Yeah, good night. good night, sir. Good night. Good night. Good night, sir. Good night, sir. Thank you. Okay. Good night, sir. Thanks to all.